this afternoon. So I'm just going to introduce the seminar series briefly, introduce our speakers, and then uh, we will start the session. So uh, SETSIS um, stands for Socio-Ecological Transition Seminars, and it's a joint initiative between the Research Group on Collective Action Change and Transition at the University of Trento, the Center for Sustainable and Social Responsible Consumption at Bournemouth University, and the environmental sociology section at the University of River. So we are a group of academics organizing the seminar uh, series, thinking at themes of transition, change, sustainability, and socio-ecological reproduction. So today we are very lucky to have with us Fatima Portillo from Federal Rural University of Rio de Janeiro, who will present a research on political consumption in uh, Latin America. Her presentation is based on her work, uh, Politicizing Consumption in Latin America, which was published in the Oxford Handbook of Political Consumerism. And um, just a few words about Fatima. Fatima is an associate professor of sociology of consumption, and her research focuses on processes of politicization of consumption in everyday life, food activism, alternative food networks, and social movements. And we're also very lucky to have uh, Anne Talenter as a discussant today with us. Uh, Anne is a professor of sustainability and business at Leeds University. She has a background in economics and development studies, and her research focuses on corporate social responsibility and particularly on ethical and fair trade and uh, food systems. So without further ado, I'm going to leave the floor to Fatima and then we're going to move on with the discussion. Thank you, Fatima. Okay, Roberta, thank you very much. Um, hi, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you, with you today. Um, first of all, congratulations for this set seminars. It's quite a bit interesting. And uh, many thanks, especially for uh, Francesca, who invited me. And also thank you very much for Roberta, Sara, and, and other people who are helping and organizing this uh, event. It's a great opportunity to share with some ideas and some reflections with you. And uh, well, now I'm going to share my um, presentation. Just a moment. Uh -huh. Is it OK? Let me just change it now. I think it's OK. OK, so um, I will present some data and some uh, reflections that I discussed in the chapter 25 of the uh, Oxford Handbook on Political Consumerism, which I had the pleasure to have uh, Michelle Nicolet as uh, my uh, co-author. And uh, this is the book. It's a quite big book. I have one copy here. And uh, well, this important book is uh, edited uh, by Michelle Michelet and also Magnus Bosson, who are with, uh, without us nowadays, uh, today, sorry. <laughs> um, I'm a bit nervous, um, but OK, it's, I will do this. And also Peter Osteva. Um, so and then I brought data from the research uh, I present in this chapter 25, and also I brought data from researches conducted with my grad students at uh, Federal Rural University of Rio de Janeiro that's based in Brazil. Um, well, um, when I was invited to write uh, a chapter for this book, I first received a book proposal, and uh, this book proposal uh, surprised me in lots of top topics, but especially in one topic. The book proposal said that Latin America was a place, pay attention, dominated by the production of political consumer labeled goods, for example, fair trade uh, coffee in Latin America, uh, that would be consumed by conscious consumers at North America and Europe. This idea is not exactly wrong, but this idea seemed very strange to me initially, I have to confess. Uh, and then I asked myself, did the book proposal believe that there are no consumers in Latin America and there are no politicized consumers in Latin America? It's strange for me. For me, this idea reinforced 
the common sense that the South produces and the North consumes as if there were no consumers in Latin America or in the South in general. Thus, uh, it seems to me that the dominant assumption was that in Latin America, there are only producers of labeled goods for conscious consumers in the North. Of course, countries in the, from the global South do produce labeled goods which are exported uh, to the global north and consumed for, from the, the uh, conscious consumer in the north. The kind of production, this kind of production, even maybe uh, works as a driving force towards the politicization of consumers in the south. But this kind of idea assumes that consumer and consumption and uh, consumer society is a, an exclusive matter of the so-called developed countries in the global north, and that the global south only produces consumer goods for them. Therefore, there is a risk uh, of neglecting and overlooking their status and their rights as consumers and also a risk of neglecting their political agency as consumers as well. Uh, but in fact, even scholars from the South normally uh, ignore the possibilities of consumers' actions in developing societies. So this is not a problem only from, of the North scholars, but also of the South scholars as well. Um, so I had to start the chapter saying that, yes, there, is, there are consumers in Latin America, and maybe there are politicized consumers in Latin America as well. Moreover, uh, Latin America has a very, very, very strong and diversity tradition of social engagements and social movements with both classical and uh, postmodern profiles. And these movements seem to be incorporating consumers' mobilization into their political strategy. And here was my initial question. How social movements in Latin, Amer in Latin America deal with political consumerism, okay? Um, well, about the research itself. Uh, to write the chapter, I used secondary quantitative data on individual political consumerism available uh, to some Latin America countries, especially Brazil, Argentina, Mexico, and Chile. Uh, then I used the primary qualitative data uh, I made some interviews with the uh, leadership of consumer protection organizations in Brazil, in Chile, and in Peru. And I also collected some data from Mexico and Colombia. Uh, and uh, the third set of data came from research conducted with my grad students on peasant movements in Brazil, especially two movements, um, MST, the very well-known well -known, uh, landless workers movements, and also MPA, there is a small farmers movement. It's a less well-known movement. Um, so, uh, no, just a moment. Um, for this presentation, however, I will only consider it, I will only address data from number two and number three of this, um, um, these ideas, uh, these two types of social movements, um, uh, defense protection, um, so, sorry, consumer protection movements and organizations, and also um, peasant movements. Of course, the conclusions I will present here um, has, have some limitations because I'm using data from only two types of social movements, consumer protection organizations and uh, peasant movements, okay? 
Uh, well, uh, regarding uh, the first one, uh, um, uh, the consumer protection organizations, I brought data from five institutions. El Poder del Consumidor, uh, which means the power of consumer from Mexico. The IDEC, that is uh, the Brazilian Institute for Consumer Protection from Brazil. The NGO Educar Consumidores, which means uh, to educate consumers from Colombia. ASPEC from Peru, that means um, the Peruvian Association for Consumers and Users. And finally, Consumers International, that is not exactly an organization from Chile. It's an international organization, but its office for Latin American and Caribbean is based in Santiago, the capital of Chile. Uh, so I interviewed a person who works for this uh, Latin American office in Chile, okay? So we have data from four consumer protection organizations and from one international organization based in Latin America, okay? Uh, the main example uh, here will be action against the soft drink industry for health and environmental reasons. Um, well, the four uh, consumer protection organizations analyzed, they organized actions against the soft industry, this, uh, the soft drink industry, sorry. And all of them, all the four uh, protection, uh, the consumer protection organizations, all of them used the four forms of political consumerism, boycotts, boycotts, discursive action, and lifestyle changes. All of them sometimes organize a boycott of Coca-Cola. There is the paradigm of uh, soft drinks. They engaged in street uh, protests. They encourage uh, people to change lifestyles. And also they stimulate boycotts by asking people to drink water or natural juice instead of Coca-Cola or soft sugar drinks in general. Um, so yes they acted in terms of political consumerism. But they mainly, they mainly used the strategy of influencing parliamentarians to raise fees, to regulate the advertisement, and to create labeling about the high sugar content. So they are much more engaged with lobby and advocacy than with political consumerism, okay? Let's see the example of IDEC from Brazil. They, boy, uh, they say that boycott is not the main tool for them. They don't use the term boycott explicitly. They avoid blaming consumers and giving them the responsibility to solve problems in the market. They avoid naming good or, and bad companies. So IDEC considers that actions of individuals, consumers are important, but if uh, it's even more important for them and effective to lobby political institutions to protect citizens and consumers in a more conventional way. Political consumerism is considered for IDEC, too limited and can lead to a very individualistic vision of problem solving without effective public interest, impacts. So IDEC prefers to stimulate collective rather than individual actions. So they are more engaged with lobby and advocacy than with political consumerism. Now let's see the example of ASPEC the Peruvian Association. Um, they were interviewed um, from ASPEC. As, uh, ASPEC uh, uh, gave me more or less the same information from IDEC. In short, um, um, no, no, sorry. Just me, just a moment. Yeah. Um, the case in, in terms of aspect, we can see the case of la leche que no es leche, that means the milk that's not milk. So 
After a scandal with a modified diary product produced in Peru by the large corporation Gloria and sold as milk, Aspect launched, launched a campaign called La Leche Que No Es Leche, that means milk that's not milk, and fought to ban images of a cause on the packaging. Aspect as a Zedek also used the four forms of political consumerism, but put much more effort into pressing the government into more striking regulation of the sector, its advertising, and it's packing. So the aspect used much more lobby and advocacy than political consumerism. Uh, the Peruvian um, person from aspect interviewed said to me, aspect doesn't use this word boycott because in Peru it's considered Una palabra muy gringa in Spanish, that means a very American word. So Peruvians, she said to me, don't manage very well the word boycott. The word boycott is still much more challenging. So they don't use boycott and boycott. They, they do it, but they don't like or they don't believe in this kind of political activism. Um, so, in short, IDEC and ASPEC, like probably other social movements in, like, in Latin America, they even use the four forms of political consumerism. But the biggest efforts are to strengthen public policies and government regulation of the market. So they act more in the conventional scope of lobby and advocacy than in consumption-based political activism. Um, the interview from the Office of Consumers International for Latin America confirmed these ideas uh, during the interview. She said, Latin American social movements do not like concepts such as political consumerism although they mobilize the consumers to put pressure on markets and governments. They, um, the, the NGOs from Latin America, they consider that this expression, political consumerism, consumerism is at odds with the more conventional and ideological categories of citizen, citizens and uh, workers. Some Latin America NGOs with more global actions use these ideas but those with more locally rooted action don't. The main effort is to change laws, build public policies, and strengthen the regulatory power of states. So let's turn now to the example of the classic social movements in Brazil, specifically the case of MST, uh, the very well-known uh, movement, landless, uh, peasant movement, workers movement. Since the 70s, MST uh, have been fighting for agrarian reform and distributive justice in Brazil. At the times, its struggles must target national government and it had a strong anti-capitalism uh, frame. Uh, nothing to do with consumption, nothing to do with political consumerism as well, right? So, since the 90s, at the end of 90s especially, MST began to incorporate the strategy of political consumerism, which can be observed from changes in its slogans. One of the new slogans uh, created by MST is Se o campo não planta, a cidade não janta. That means, if the countryside doesn't plant, the city doesn't eat. The main leader of MST claimed that it was now necessary to enlarge the movement's focus and created an alliance with people from the city, pay attention, not consumers, but people from the city. 
in favor of a small and familiar agriculture and of course and, and uh, with a more sustainable agriculture as well. It's quite interesting that nowadays NST is organizing fairs to sell agrarian reform products, investing in politicizing consumption and consumers uh, boycott in this case. NST also created shops in lots of Brazilian capitals to sell agrarian reform products. NST even created their own brand. Look, this is a social movement, the very classical social movement, anti-capitalism movement. And now they have their own brand. The name of brand is Terra Viva, that means living earth. With this appeal, agrarian reform products. But the movement barely mentions the word consumers preferring city workers, uh, basket holders, whatever, but never, or almost never consumer. Consumer is not a category for them. Thus maintaining the framework in the production side of and of course, neglecting the consumer one. So with these examples, I hope I show it uh, what I understand uh, as the main specificities of political consumerism in Latin America. First, political consumerism doesn't seem to be the main form of activism in Latin America. Second, lobbying and advocacy are the main tools of social movements, keeping the politics in the sphere of the state and not that of the market. And uh, as the third point, there are ambiguities, discomforts and hesitations in dealing with the consumer as a political category and with consumption as a sphere that can be politicized. By doing this, Latin American social movements keep politics in the class struggle, social inequalities, and in the worker category, not in the consumer. So they avoid the use of consumer as a political category. To conclude, I would like to point, to point out challenges and opportunities for the process of politicization of consumption in Latin America. One, on the one hand, the ambiguities, discomforts, and tensions with the consumer category can weaken the process of politicization of consumption. On the other hand, we see few theoretical and, politi and political advances. But in terms of opportunities, we can see that even classical uh, social movements like MEST are reinforcing the active citizen and critical role that consumers can assume, although they see political consumerism ambiguously. And uh, it can represent new political strategy and new alliances, commitments, and solidarities for social changes. Well, um, for future studies, I could say that the possibilities for the growth of political consumerism in the Latin America seem to lie mainly at the peasant movements and around food issues. This is uh, the direction I, I suppose political consumerism is uh, taking. Uh, that's all for a while. Uh, thank you very much for the attention. Thank you, Fatima. That was um, absolutely brilliant and um, so refreshing to hear about the perspective that is so different from what we uh, are used to in the North, uh, whatever this concept might mean, uh, both in organizations that deal with consumer issues and within studies of political consumption. So I really like this idea of 
uh, this discomfort with the concept of consumer and also this idea that systemic issues cannot be tackled through individual responsibilities. I think it was really, really refreshing to hear. Um, so I'm going to pass the, the floor to Anne now for some discussion, uh, and then we're going to open the debate to, to questions. Uh, Anne, are you happy to? Yeah, I've, um, I'm happy to make, make some comments. I, I, I read Fatima's um, chapter with interest from a couple of years ago, um, and it was really it, lovely to hear you present it and see how it's moved on. And some of the things that were making me think when I was rereading it the last couple of days, uh, you've started to answer some of them. So that's fabulous. Um, so uh, my just, name... uh, And sorry, uh, if you could please speak a, a bit slowly, I could... Sorry, that was me fine, being but... enthusiastic and I have a note to myself saying speak slowly. So, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> but uh, it was that was heartfelt enthusiasm and thank you. <laughs> so that was, so I'll, I'll calm down. <laughs> so thank you very much. It was a really real pleasure to hear, hear you, um, you speak and to talk about present both the findings from a few years ago and bring it up to date. Um, I really liked how you end, end, ended that, but I also found it fascinating how you started and with what you were asked to write about, um, about where consumption, you know, about political consumption in Latin America and that reminder that, a, that there are consumers everywhere. Um, and I think that thread of discomfort and where the ideas come through, come from, um, or where they, where they should come from, <laughs> threaded through what you were saying all, all the way through. I think that was really helpful. Um, so I think, I think that Roberta asked me to um, speak to this um, presentation and be a dis discussant today because of our shared interest in fair trade. And also, the, we're going to do a little ad later about the Fair Trade Symposium that we're doing, we're running next year. And one of the things that we're asking in our symposium next year is about how fair trade needs to change and needs to listen to voices from around the world. Um, and I know that there's been discussions about the idea of local fair trade. And, and it not just being a label in the same way that the fair trade label has been set up. It being it could be something different. It could be about alliances. And that's what I really liked how you ended your story today about the alliances between the work, the, the peasant farmers movements and the people in the city. Um, so I think that's why um, Roberta asked me to speak today to, to, to raise some questions. Um, so I've got this, I've done some work on fair trade um, over the years, but not in Latin America. So that I, I, so I come to this quite new in many ways. Uh, I did um, research on fair trade in an African context, but I was always very interested in the different contexts in which fair trade and different approaches to, um, making production and consumption ethical, it's different in different contexts, in different countries. So we see very big differences um, between Latin America and the African experience, and then again in Asia, and then in each of the different countries as well. Um, I'm, I'm very struck at the moment at the different attitudes and approaches to food markets um, in my own work at the moment, working with farmers in Tanzania, and in Ghana, very different attitudes and very different languages and concepts that they think are important. So that's just coming from that farmer side of things. Um, so let me find my, my notes. Um, so I think you read, you're, right, you're really providing a, an important contribution to rethinking modes of consumption beyond these northern centric narratives. And I think um, not just in empirical examples, but I think how are they framed and where the starting point is. Um, 
so where do we start analyzing um, these things? I've got some questions about the starting point for research. Where do we start? Um, and I think, as you say, putting the politics into polit political consumption and understanding the interface with a variety of political actors, I think is really important. So the emphasis that you're putting on the in interface with government, and you've mentioned low, um, national government a lot, we might also think about um, city level as well as an important level to think about. Um, it was also interesting to hear about that collectivist orientation being threading right through. So that's another theme I was picking up. It's not just about the individual consumer or even the individual. Um, so yeah, we're talking about groups and cohorts of people, of people identifying as workers perhaps, and as farmers, but also the importance of the household. I think that came out in your, in your chapter. So not just about the individual, but the different social structures in which they're, um, um, they're organized. So lots of, lots of different things, I think theoretically and conceptually you're bringing as well as that empirical basis about the roles of different actors, the social structures, um, and it's not all about the, the label. Um, so I think some open questions, I don't know how much um, you want me to do, just raising some thoughts. I think some interesting questions are um, that we might ask ourselves about is, what are the concerns of political cons consumerism in Latin America? Because you've talked about um, the, the, the farm workers raising issues about sustainable production and their own livelihoods. What are the other narratives that are coming through? and concerns. I think one of the phrases in the book, you talked about material and post-material. Um, so how much of the bots are balanced between these two? Um, so also the, how much um, do we see threaded through um, consumers' concerns about safety of food and how much does that link with ideas about sustainability of food? Does that, is that a theme? at my notes. Um, I, I did write quite a few comments in my, my, in my own notes about um, the farmers movements, but I think you've spoken because you start a, in the chapter you say a little bit about that, but it, I was just thought it was great how you, you expanded that a lot more um, in, in, in what you've talked about today, but also emphasizing the Yeah, those examples of how those farmers' movements are not just lobbying um, and raising their issues with, with the, the people in the city, but also taking the products to the city. So some of that's what we might see as conventional political consumerism, um, but not necessarily, as you say, labelled as such. So it was really useful to see, nice to see those examples. Um, one thing I wanted again reading the, the, the chapter I had some questions about methods and how we might research this topic and it was interesting to see that you um, didn't talk about the surveys so much and focus much more on the qualitative data and I think that and I, I completely agree that that was the right place well I think that's where we get more more, more richness and more depth about what is actually happening rather than people saying, yes, yes, this is, I like it or I don't like it. You get that story of how they're using the tools. So I was thinking about in future research, what would be the balance of different methods? Um, so how much more um, focus group findings or conversations and interviews with, with different um, actors? And I think how much you would build on that? How could you build on, on, on that? that foundation because I think the surveys that you introduced in the book chapter are quite um, at conflict with some of the, the findings that you show later. So I was interested in the different methods that you'd use but also where do you start when we're doing this kind of research? So you've talked today about interviewing representative cons representatives of consumer movements and of the farmers' movements. Um, 
So your seems to be that your, your starting point is that organized civil society. But I was also interested in what, how you might investigate this more if we started with business and different categories of business and business that was based in, in Latin America and what, how they might be shaping political consumption. Do they have a different take on it? Are they co-opting it in some way or are they responding to some you know, legitimate um, concerns? We might also start with the state, but that wouldn't be quite so new perhaps. So just think about what's your starting point methodologically. Um, I did have some questions about coming back to fair trade, about um, to what extent is fair trade in Latin America about, about buy cuts, and you've, you've showed us that it probably isn't just about that, it's, it's, it's broader. Um, but I was wondering, maybe there's a future direct, moving on to the ideas about future directions. I think there's more we can think about, about um, what does local fair trade mean in a Latin American context, building on, you've talked about the label and the approach, Terra Viva in, in, in Brazil. But also there's um, how, how similar or different is that to this um, in Simbolo de Pequenos Productores in, in Mexico? So interesting to, a question. A project somebody could do. Uh, and so finally, I was very interested to see about your future directions. So you've talked about today about the um, future research focusing on the peasant movement and on food issues. Um, so I think where I, I was wondering then, how would you fit, work, how would um, what business is doing and um, what companies are doing interface with that would be one of my questions about future research. Um, but it's very exciting. And uh, I'm sorry, I've, lot, I've thrown lots of things at you, but I thought there was a lots of, of number of threads that, that uh, might be helpful for our discussion about the topics, the alliances, future directions and methods. So that was four, four areas. So thanks very much for listening. And thanks very much again for the paper. Okay, thanks, Anne. Uh, should I re re answer now, Roberta? Uh, yes, we can. Okay. Yes, yes, thank you. Okay, let's try. Uh, it's lots of good questions, and uh, I will try to address some, at least some of them. Uh, about fair trade, um, I'm not specialized in fair trade, but there are lots of discussions about South South fair trade. Uh, not only in South North, but also South South. And uh, uh, fair trade and other kinds of uh, labeled goods like organic, for example, uh, this, it, ha it has a lots of problems, but I, I would address one problem. Uh, sometimes these labeled goods exclude the small farmers because they don't have conditions to attend uh, lots of um, uh, standardizations, for example, and uh, some uh, consumers' movements in, in Brazil, at least, I don't know about Latin America as, well, uh, as a whole, but in Brazil, some, con some politicized consumers prefer don't buy, for example, organic food in supermarkets, but they prefer to buy non-organic food directly with small farmers. Um, so, uh, because they, they, there is, um, a, they, they criticize the labeled goods as well. So this is a quite interesting question to study. Um, I think another important question to say is um, um, the Latin American scholars uh, have lots of troubles with cons consumers and consumer society and political consumerism as well. Uh, it has to do with uh, the very strong to Marxist tradition in social sciences in Latin America and also in Brazil. So speak, to, speak about consumer and consumption is not a good topic. It's, even, it's not even a legitimate topic to study. So nobody is, is studying uh, consumption or political consumerism in Latin America and Brazil. We can count maybe five or six people in Latin America who are dedicating 
dedicated to study this topic because this is not a legitimate topic to study. So it's a shame because we don't have um, lots of uh, researchers about the topic. So to write the, the chapter, I used secondary data from my colleagues, one for, from Chile, Tomás Aristia, and the other one from Brazil, Fabian Chegaray. And they, uh, Fabian especially have uh, um, survey data. The, the, she has, sorry, he has survey data. And I don't agree completely with his data because um, it's quantitative and he was interested in compare how many uh, consumers in Brazil or in Mexico or in Argentina prefer, they say they, they could be, they could do boycott or could do boycott, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, it doesn't say much for me. Uh, and, and probably there is a paradox, important paradox here, because we have politicized consumers in Latin America and also in Brazil, uh, especially in Brazil that I can say more. And uh, so there is politicized consumers, but there isn't social movements interested in politicized consumers. And there isn't scholars or there aren't, sorry, scholars interested in study the process of politicization of consumption. So it's a paradox uh, because consumers are doing lots of activities and uh, uh, for example, choosing um, different things, uh, foodstuffs and uh, fashion clothes and uh, services and uh, using biking, whatever, uh, but the social movements don't and uh, when I when I am invited to speak for social movements, when I say political consumerism, they just oh come on, it's not serious. It's 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 a word for the north. It's a kind of uh, uh, how the Peruvian say says to, said to me, as una palabra muy gringa, which means it's American thing. It is a cheap silly thing. It's not important. It's not for us. We have to fight in the anti-capitalism frame. We have to fight from the, the side of workers, not consumers. Because if I put the emphasis in consumer, I am um, uh, taking the emphasis from workers. And it's not, it doesn't happen only with consumer movement or political consumerism. It also, pay attention, it also happened when we talk about feminist, because if you talk about woman, we are taking the emphasis from worker. <laughs> it's quite a surprise, maybe. Uh, we have, so lots of social movements in Latin America, especially the uh, more classic, and with this anti-capitalism frame, they prefer to use all, only worker. Worker is the main category. If you use a woman or black people or young people or consumers or even citizens, it's a way to, to um, avoid or to take the attention from the really important things there is, the, class struggle. <laughs> yeah, uh, so they prefer maintain the, the, uh, the politics in the classical uh, uh, topics like worker, like uh, capital versus worker, like class struggle, etc, etc. And uh, I think this is a theoretical problem uh, because it's weakness the possibility to study a, a social phenomenon, an important social phenomenon that happens in Latin America as well, because uh, political consumers, as we say, uh, as you know, uh, is spreading for all the world in different ways and with different uh, uh, specificities, but it is spreading. And it's not as if, if it's not a study in Latin America, we don't know about, it, about how it is spreading. So it's not it's, it's sufficiently studied in Latin America. 
Um, so yeah, the tradition of the Latin America social movements is much more collectivist, is much more anti-capitalist, is much more centered in the worker, cla worker classes. Um, so, uh, but uh, for me, it's a surprising that's the more, the, I, I could say the more classical movement, there are the peasant movements. It's in the peasant move, movement that I can see um, more possibilities to understand and to deal with political consumerism. It's from there who is coming political consumerism, I think. It's a, it's a hypothesis. So when I compare, for example, um, consumer protection organizations, environmental organizations, um, other social movements and peasant movements, it seems to me that peasant movement is much more open to political consumerism than the others. Of course, for them, it's difficult to deal with, with this topic. And then, as I said, they, don't, they, they try to avoid to say consumers. They say working uh, seat workers, basket holders. It's funny because they try to avoid the worker. Okay, I don't mention consumer for them. I can say workers, no problem for me. <laughs> but in fact, they are politicizing consume, consumption. Uh, they are uh, selling consumption, uh, sorry, goods produced in agrarian reform settlements. So they are politicizing consumption, even if they don't want to talk about. <laughs> it's quite funny. Um, and about methods, um, we organized the um, uh, um, uh, quali qualitative data some years ago uh, with young people in Brazil, just in Brazil. And then we have quite interesting data um, from this research. And nowadays we are preparing uh, the second round of uh, qualitative data with young people in Brazil um, using focus group. And uh, one of the ideas uh, or, or better, one of the conclusions of the first round is that in Brazil, because of lots of uh, explanations, um, young people um, stay in the house of parents for a, a, a large age, maybe 30, 40 years old, they are still living with the parents. So in this case, they don't have to deal with political consumerism or political decisions in their daily lives because the parents do it. So this is an important question. The family in Latin America has a very strong role and uh, all the decisions uh, are in, in the hands of especially the housewives. And this is a, a problem. And we are now investigating it in more deep way. And uh, the other uh, conclusion is that because if we have very strong social movements, people normally uh, keep with the movements um, the solutions for the problem. So I don't have to change my life. I don't have to boycott or boycott or whatever, because social movements will fight for all these questions, environmental questions, health, healthy questions, etc. So people, uh, left the the pro this problem solution the, so the problem solving in the hands of social movements because of the tradition it's uh, one explanation um, about corporations um, we have uh, we have uh, lots of um, um, projects about uh, uh, social responsibilities of corporations and normally we say Corporation very active, especially the big one, the biggest, uh, the international corporations are much more active in terms of uh, um, respond the questions about civil society. And uh, we also have uh, um, corporations um, sponsoring NGOs and social movements uh, in terms of uh, conscious consumers. 
for example, um, we have ACATU, there is an ins institution in, uh, sponsored by corporations in Brazil, very strong, and they use the, the idea of consci uh, uh, conscious consumers. But normally, social movements don't like the idea of conscious consumers. They prefer responsible consumers. So they are fighting sometimes about words, which, which words the better. <laughs> responsible, conscious, sustainable. But normally, we don't use political consumerism in Latin America. And, and NGOs don't use this word, this um, concept. Government don't use this, this concept, and uh, cooperation doesn't use this concept, and also social movements don't use this concept. It's quite strange. So they act, but they don't use the concept because this concept is very American. So it's, it's a quite a kind of a resistance. It's very interesting topic to study. So uh, I don't know if I answer all your interesting questions in the I'm still available. I think, you've, yeah, I, think, I think you've, yeah, very, very fully. And uh, yeah, I was just trying to stimulate the broader di discussion as well to see what other people might think. So thank you. I'll have to, I think Roberta might have the next next steps. Yes, thank, thank you so much both. And I think this opens up the debate wonderfully because we have so many things that have been kind of touched upon the theoretical weakness in literature and studies around this um, discomfort uh, about the con concept of consumer. But also, Fatima, you were highlighting a lot of future research um, opportunities where I really enjoyed the um, opportunities that you have found in the peasant movement and the links between the peasant movement and po po political consumerism, which is quite paradoxical and, and really interesting to explore. So uh, I'm not going to take up more space. I'm just going to open up the debate. So uh, whoever has a question, please feel free just to unmute yourself and um, directly ask, or you can post your questions in the chat if you prefer. I'm going to monitor to see if anyone is um, raising hands or... Uh, Magnus, hi, hello. Um, please feel free to unmute yourself and go, and then I see Elizabeth. Hi, uh, you're going to go next. Um, please go ahead. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you for a great presentation also and a great chapter in the book. It's uh, it's so nice to have this um, in the um, country chapters or region chapters in the in the book. And uh, I pre I especially liked your uh, when you discussed the word political consumerism and how it doesn't resonate in the in the in Latin America. One one uh, reflection maybe to anyone else also is that the, this reluctance to use the word the word or political consumerism might also appear in uh, like my country for example Sweden uh, but maybe in other ways. Um, uh, than in Latin America, but I think also there is some um, reluctance to to tie politics to individual acts. Also in <laughs> in countries where we see more of political consumerism, so I think there are lessons also for the other uh, countries. That yeah, the, reading your chapter and uh, listen to your ideas is also kind of saying something about other context as well, I think. Uh, I don't know what the other Swedish or European uh, uh, says. I wonder about also um, another question is that, what about anti-consumption in uh, Latin America? Uh, and, uh, you know, down downshifting, uh, minimalism, can you say something about that? The, the, these kind of examples. Um, critique against overconsumption. Uh, and the third question, how, in, in, uh, in news media in Sweden, at least, we hear a lot about the 
the last uh, the, since Bolsonaro came to power, uh, and now it changed again. But we we we. <laughs> We read a lot about the, the Amazonas, for example, and, um, and that is linked to con our consumption in the north. Uh, it still sets in the in their frame and um, yeah, cutting down the forest. Uh, has that, um, make, ha the recent years, has that been a bad debate in, in Brazil and has it affected political consumerism, the phenomenon, and uh, not necessarily the word, but the phenomenon? Uh, so that's, Okay. Great. Thank you, Magnus. Thank you very much. Yes, we had the election one week, one week ago, and fortunately, Lula wins the election. Um, it, it, it was a quite hard period. Four years with Bolsonaro was really bad for us. And um, But pay attention, it's quite interesting because Lula was in the government, were in the government for 80 years in the past. And in that time, uh, he was very criticized by the leftist because he was doing an inclusion for, uh, about consumption, uh, an inclusion through consumption. Yeah. So he was trying to put everybody in the consumer society. And uh, poor people, uh, for the first time, having the opportunity to buy lots of things. And uh, the leftists was critici were criticizing Lula because he was doing um, inclusion through consumption and it was bad. So nowadays, leftists are ob obliging to rethinking about this because of course we need to improve and uh, um, to grow consumption of uh, working people and uh, poor classes. Uh, so this is a quite great debate in Brazil nowadays. And, uh, but there is one interesting question is, uh, for example, um, during a dictatorship or in the case of Bolsonaro, it was not exactly a dictatorship, but it's a quite autocratic power. And during uh, this kind of, uh, of government, um, political consumerism should be growth or not? And uh, it's a hypothesis uh, because during Bolsonaro government, we do we didn't have a uh, space uh, to um, to talk with the government or to to press the government in the traditional ways. So in this example, in this moment, maybe people could um, move to um, new new ways of. Uh, politicization like consumption political consumerism for example so this is a question i we don't have we don't i can't see exactly if this happened because you don't have data but i can suppose that people were trying to press politically with uh, through consumption because we didn't have space with another uh, councils for example because everything was banned during bolsonaro government so maybe it's uh, opened a possibility to political consumerism. I'm not completely sure, but probably yes. And uh, this idea of inclusion through consumption, social inclusion through consumption is quite polemic nowadays in Brazil. So I have to study it in more deep way as well. Thank you. We have Elizabeth and uh, Francesca. Uh, thank you so much for a, a fantastic presentation. Um, I have the book and hadn't read the whole chapter until um, preparing for uh, hearing you today. And it's it's so interesting. I had one um, kind of two topics I hoped you might be able to comment on. Um, the first was it's so striking to me the juxtaposition between um, what the where the conversation is going um in especially the US context but in the i think broader context of the US Canada and and um Europe a political consumerism replacing or substituting for traditional forms of social engagement social movements and political activism and so there were kind of three works that come to mind that are totally the juxtaposition of what you're describing um Anand Gerharadis's book Winner Takes All 
which describes political consumerism and the use of markets for political change as sort of an elite venture um, used to mask elite interests. So it really is serving um, uh, the elites more than, than the working class. Um, Mara Einstein's book, um, Compassion Inc., talking about the, the demand for consumers to use their consumer power to do things in the world um, as a shaming device and a way to depoliticize people and to internalize the individual responsibility. And then a, a few different works by Jason Spicer, Marshall Gans, um, um, on how social enterprise and hybrid businesses are not actually social change. They're really more serving elite interests than they are the masses. So thinking about this body of work that's coming out of the American context about how political consumerism is really a force of the elite capitalist um, reifying traditional power and wealth inequalities, not challenging them at all, is in just stark contrast to, to what you're showing about hanging on in Latin America to the need for politics and social movements and, and putting the worker above all of these other constructs. And so that juxtaposition was just so jarring and startling, and I'd never really put it together before your presentation. So I, all of that to say, my first question is, um, can you say something about how your work is should be challenging how we think about political consumerism or why is it so different between North and South? Um, is does what you're is what you're showing kind of challenging something that we've learned in, in the North? Um, is it about historical trajectory? Is there a fear that the pendulum just goes too far, that once you've politicized consumerism, it moves toward this awful neoliberal model um, that we're having critiques about in the North? So um, anything that you can offer about this stark contrast? And then my second question is very short and simple. Um, I was hoping you might be able to say more about um, whether and how you hear people talk about wages and living wages and wealth and income inequality and wealth distribution and value chains and corporations um, and, and these acts of political consumerism. And, and I asked this for a similar reason as the first question, that in the North American context, um, the, the question about wealth distribution and value distribution has been largely taken out. And instead of focusing on these vertical questions about where value is going, there's a much easier conversation about which marginalized groups are worse off. Like, should we help indigenous groups or, or the black business owner or women-led businesses? Um, so it's about horizontal equity and not actually challenging um, vertical equity among capital holders and laborers. So I'm curious about those conversations about living wages and um, wealth distribution in the context that you study. Thank you so much. Um, for all of your research. Okay, Elizabeth, thank you for the questions. Uh, quite difficult to, well, I, I, I can't answer, but just uh, talk a little bit about the, the topics you, you, you brought. Um, I think the, the question is, um, social movements are anti-liberal. This is the topic. And then when you talk about consumerism or consumption or whatever, we are talking in liberal terms. And, uh, but this is a problem. This is a problem because we are not uh, taking, a, a, the, we're not, we're not uh, using the idea of politicizing also the market. And then uh, as they defend um, only uh, anti-liberal um, schemes, they are not using the possibility to politicize the market as well. And I think it's a shame because um, they are, um, it's not happening. Uh, the politicization is not uh, growing. And um, in terms of marginal groups, I think the, the, especially the poor people in the big cities like Rio de Janeiro, Sao Paulo and Mexico City, and uh, Bogota, et cetera. Um, it's incredible as in Latin America nowadays, the, the poor people are in the biggest number than before. It's uh, 
quite serious problem. And then most of the social movements are um, emphasizing social inequalities. But on the other, in then we can talk about post-materialism, uh, the, the theory who, which explain part of the political consumerism. And in, in, in the case of Latin America, I think post-materialism, the theory of post-materialism is not useful to explain political consumerism uh, because most of the, the topics of social movements are not um, related only to post-materialism because if I consider post-materialism, I would say that there isn't environmental movements in Latin America. <laughs> because once we don't resolve our material basic problems, we, we don't uh, invest or we don't um, um, have interest in environmentalism, for example. And it's not true. Latin America has a very strong environmental movements nowadays, and especially uh, people who are fighting for climate justice in Latin America. So it's not post-materialist. So I, I'm not, I don't agree with the idea of post-materialist as an explanation for uh, the education of this kind of uh, new um, um, topics of uh, political fighting. Um, and also, well, I think it, no, I, I don't know. I think it's, ah, yeah. Elizabeth asked me about uh, uh, if uh, um, political consumerism could replace uh, the traditional political actions. And uh, in Latin America, of course not. It is um, complement complementation. I don't have doubts about this. It's a complementation. And uh, I'm trying to talk about this when I talk with social movements. Uh, when we um, invest in politici politicization of consumption, we are not forgetting other kinds of political activities. On the contrary, we are uh, emphasizing other new uh, forms of political action, but without replace, without forget the older ones. So it's a, I think it is. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Francesca, you, I think you were next yes. and then we have Asa. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Fatima, for uh, this presentation. I really enjoyed. I think that I, I will need time to digest <laughs> something that uh, I heard because um, this is actually was the purpose uh, to having you here. Uh, and after a, a scholar that was studying, that is studying more or less the same um, phenomena uh, in, in, in the global north, in, in Europe. So um, uh, I really like, and I think that um, um, I really appreciated what you say, that also with the many thoughts that uh, came into my mind. Um, there are a lot of similarity, but also a lot of differences uh, with the, 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 the phenomena I'm observing in Italy. Mm, um, I mean, we have individualized political consumerism, but we have also collect collectivist uh, political consumerism that is quite uh, uh, similar to the peasant um, use of political consumerism that you described. Uh, more or less, we have alternative food networks, uh, but what is missing in Italy is the target of the state. Uh, I mean, all these alternatives around political consumerism don't target the state. Uh, rather, they, they try, they attempt to, to pre prefigurate an alternative. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I, I was, I have basically two, two questions. I mean, um, do you see also this kind of idea of prefiguring pre -figur pre something different that actually a uh, citizen understand relationship, like uh, building a different society based on something more autonomous, more active citizen or more active people, I mean, that don't deal with the state? Then I have a, another uh, couple of questions. One is relating to, um, um, you say that the classical social movement, peasant movement are, uh, have started uh, at the turn of the century, at least in the paper, if I remember well, to inc implement, uh, incorporate political consumerist uh, action within the more general, more conventional repertoire of action. 
why is that? I mean, what happened? Do, can you tell us a little bit uh, more about what, how you can explain this shift? Because for example, the way we explain this shift in Italy is because in 1999, and I was curious about that, there was a kind of failure of the global justice movement. So what happened to a grassroots organization that joined this mass um, uh, international mobilization that, uh, that failed, basically? They started to go back uh, in their territory to try to build something different be also because they they fail to address state local state i mean national state but also international power um so i i, I was wondering if there is something that uh, you can can explain why um, the peace and movement started to incorporate uh, political consumerism then i have another question that if you can say a little bit more about the rule of corporations because i i, I cannot i couldn't understand very well um, your position about that or your argument about that. Because for example, in Italy, we are, and in, and in Europe uh, in general, we are very much concerned of uh, uh, cooptation uh, uh, from, by, by corporation of, for example, social movement practices. Alternative Food Network, for example, is an example. Now we can find uh, uh, similar products in the supermarket. And this is also, as uh, um, taking away people uh, from this uh, grassroots social movement that they were trying to uh, change um, uh, the power system within the, the food chain. Um, so I would like to, to understand if there is something around also with, the, with this idea of uh, cooptation of this cooperation, because I might have misunderstood, but maybe you, you think that they have a positive uh, effect and regarding this positive effect, I, I was um, also thinking about outcome of social movement. So um, reading your paper and also listening to your presentation, it seems to me that addressing the state do, do mean something. I, actually, they were able to change the rules of the game for everybody, for the sugar things, for example. So, and this is something that uh, I, I see that is missing in our social movement organization around, uh, around political consumerism, especially the, the peace movement, uh, the alternative uh, food networks, because they avoid to address the state. They don't, they, don't they don't address the state. And they remind, they tend to remind very elitists. That is something that uh, apparently is very difficult to the peasant movement uh, in, uh, in, in Brazil and in, in Latin America. So a, little, a lot of things, but uh, thank you very much. Um, okay. okay, Francesca, thank you. Um, yeah, lots of interesting questions. Um, I think, uh, yeah, of course, um, alternative food networks and this kind of things are very strong in Brazil. I can, I can talk about Latin America. It's quite big content, but... I, now I, I prefer just talk about Latin America, about Brazil. But it's quite interesting because MEST in normally, traditionally are, as I said, anti-capitalist movement, okay? And now they are going to the market. They are creating new markets. So the conception of marketing uh, uh, sorry, the conception of market is changing. Now, market is saw for them by them as a way of resistance. <laughs> so, how MSD or and small farmers can resist to big companies, capitalism, etc., creating markets for them, assessing market, assessing consumer markets. So they create their own markets, fairs of agrarian reform, shops of agrarian reforms. Uh, so it's quite strange and quite new and quite a challenging for scholars in Brazil to understand and to explain why MST, uh, which are a movement that try to uh, improve social justice, now they, they are on of a shop. <laughs> and yeah, MST is the own of a, um, a network of shopping in Brazil. There are maybe 10 shops in all the country. So because having a shop ac access the market is a way of a resistance. So they want to sell their products and they want to sell their products to workers, not to 
rich people. They want to sell for workers. But the, the products are not very cheap. So they have a contradiction in this way because they say, uh, worker from the countryside produce good food for worker from the city. But who is buying this product if it's not, uh, not cheap? It's quite expensive product. So uh, once I put this question for them and they say, no, but maybe blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so it's a contradiction. But the question is market for them is not nowadays uh, a topic it should be uh, fighting against. Market is a place to be conquested. So they are, they are trying to conquest market. They are trying to create new markets. We, we use the word create in this, in, this, um, uh, in this way. They are creating market, direct market with consumer or conscious consumer or politicized consumers. So people, young people in general, love to go to the MEST shop. There are cultural activities at night and everybody uses the cap. The, the red cap is the symbol of MSD in Brazil, and nowadays it's in fashion. Everybody uses cap, red cap to go to dancing club, etc. Um, so to support MSD, yeah. And then uh, support MSD using the red cap, but also especially buying products from agrarian reform. I think it's quite interesting topic to study as well. And uh, about co-optation, of course, there are these fair in the social movements to be co-optated by big corporations. And we are, we have this risk all the time. Uh, by, on the other hand, I, I, I have to say that lobby and advocacy, it's not working. <laughs> They are trying lobbying uh, the parliamentarians and the governments, but it's not working because the big companies also act uh, through lobby and advocacy. So maybe this is not the, the best way to change the things. Uh, maybe the big corporations um, could attend, could answer, uh, respond to the um, demand from consumers, then from social movements lobbying parliamentarians, because it's not working, I think. We don't have data to affirm this idea. So this is one of my hypotheses. Lobbying is not working. So it's easier to see McDonald's, for example, attending consumers' demand than attending social movements pressure. I don't know, it's a hypothesis to be investigated. Okay. Thank you so much. These are like really central questions. Like can you politicize the market without being co-opted and the role of the corporations there? Um, Yes, probably we have time for one last question. And I think I saw other uh, hands uh, raised. So, yes. Yes, uh, thank you very much for an interesting uh, discussion and presentation. Uh, I have I have several questions, but I will try to, to um, uh, make it to uh, um, put them together somehow. I, I want to, uh, Perhaps comment on what Magnus uh, said about this focus on on the consumer in in Sweden, which is also where I where I'm at, and because um, this was I found this really interesting as well that uh, consumer and consumption is not really touched upon as uh, analytical objects, but but not uh, not discussed among um, well, in the Latin American public either, really. And um, I, I mean, I, I would say that the, the problem in, in Sweden in this context is rather, or many times that we are only seen, consumers are only seen as consumers and addressed as consumers and nothing else, so to speak. And, and, and the, the, uh, potential to act as citizen or or 
anything else than consumer is very limited. So um, I found that that interesting. And I, I wonder if you can say something about uh, who it is that are um, are practicing political consumerism, because you said that they are, I mean, they are practicing it, but they are just not calling it uh, by that name. And if there are any um, uh, alliances between between the consumer protection organizations and social movements, and also um, who are buying the, the products um, that from the social movements. Um, if there is, and, and also in regard to what, what you talked about, the class struggle being, being the, in the focus, I mean, uh, who, who, what classes, are actually buying these products and and who are engaged in in the consumer protection organizations and i also wanted to ask um what i mean because the the in in sweden this is the consumer issue is very much individualized and and i would say that um, first, I thought that what 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 do consumer organizations in Sweden what can they learn from from the more coll collectivist approach of the Latin American organizations? But then you said that lobbying isn't working or <laughs> political advocacy isn't working. So, but I mean, there are, I guess there are other things to to learn. So, just if you want to say something about perhaps the collectivist. Um, um perhaps the collectivist identity of consumers if there is one um yeah i think i think i'll stop there thank you um thank you as a uh, interesting question as well and difficult to answer uh i think we have to understand more about the political identity because which is what is it? What is it? Political identity. Uh, I don't believe there is a political identity ready, and then we use it. The political identity is constructed day by day, and if you want to politicize the uh, consumption side, we have to construct it day by day. Um, some social movements, when I talk about this topic, they they say to me, "Ah, but." Consumer is not a political agent, but it can be <laughs> if we construct it. So I think it, we need to, um, more discussions about it and without prejudice, because uh, I think social movements in, in Latin America in general have just kind of prejudice against everything who came from abroad or everything who, who, who talk about uh, consumption because it seems liberal, but we know that consum consumer doesn't came from liberal, but also, but instead of, it came from a national government who tried to empower the, um, the nationality, the, the citizenship. So I, I we, we learned it with uh, Frank Trentman, for example, that is uh, an author that I like very, very much. And we, we, he tried to understand um, how we construct the idea of consumer, from which place this idea came. And uh, in, in terms of Latin America, I, I wrote in, in the chapter, we have the, uh, a history in Latin America um, when um, worker movements in the end of 90s, for example, in the end of the 19th century, for example, use consumer uh, as a political actor. So we have lots of lots of examples in the history of Latin America in that social movements politicized consumption sphere. So why why not to do this? So uh, we have to discuss this idea and maybe to, to understand better uh, the idea of consum consumer and consumption in general. But I think one of the limitations for 
politicized consumption has to do with practice theories. Because the practice theories that I, I am studying nowadays, um, it puts lots of interrogations in the idea of reflexivity, in the idea that a consumer thinking and action, acting rationality in terms of uh, rationality. So in day by day, in the, in the routines, in the, um, uh, the necessity to attend the demands in our daily lives, we need to um, much more to respond in terms of uh, tacit knowledge than uh, reflected actions. So, and then I think this is this, uh, this point out to a uh, limitation for this idea of a, a person who would think about, reflect about, and make a decision about inform uh, considering informations. Because in daily life, we have to attend the routine. And then I think this is a quite big limitation. But yes, we have uh, uh, the historic of using political consumerism in Latin America as well, but we don't use the name. And normally we say young people, worker people, blah, 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 and never consumer, because this is not identified with a political agent. So it's a, it's a theoretical question and also a political question as well. And uh, one, one way is the alliances. The alliances uh, among the peasant movements, for example, and the other movements with um, consumers because now they are obliging to talk about consumers. They are obliged to think about, and sometimes they invite me to talk about political consumerism. They, are, they hesitate, they have uh, uh, these uh, ambiguities. I think ambiguities is the key word from, from my presentation. And they have these tensions, but even then, they are interested in understand how they can, could politicize consumers, et cetera, et cetera. So create alliances, and especially uh, during Bolsonaro government, uh, the MSJ and other social movements are completely banned to the political life. And then they had to create new ways to, um, um, to talk about their demands. For example, the demands for land that is quite uh, serious in Brazil and because we have a very big land concentration. And so MST have to talk with consumers because nowadays they are, they are for example, they present themselves like the, uh, the, the biggest um, organic rice producer in the country <laughs> because they are they are the biggest organic rice producer and then they during the elections campaign some weeks ago it was one of, of the topic um, if Lula will uh, would be or not um, give more space for MST because MST is considered by the writers like a dangerous group, like a terrorist group. And Lula said, no, MST is the, is the biggest organic rice producer. So we are, we, are, we are, yes, we are giving power for them. We are buying organic rice for them for distributing the schools, hospitals, etc. So the possibility to create alliances with consumers, in my point of view, is fundamental. That's all. Thank you. And I think closing this um, idea of alliances is really uh, brilliant. And I think probably we need to draw to a conclusion. And um, I don't know, Francesca, if you wanted to say a few final words. Uh, no, I don't know if you wanted to, to say something about your conference. I think that Anne had also a, a, a slide. You, you want to, to show it, Anne? Um, well, not necessarily the slide, but maybe, yes, I would invite uh, Anne okay. to give, just to say a few words about it, uh, because I think these seminars are also about keeping the conversation going. So maybe 
also talking about this can be another opportunity for us to keep the conversation going and meet with each other uh, at some point. Uh, Anne, uh, would you like to say very briefly a few words oh, about I can say that we're hosting a, a Fair Trade International Symposium next June in the UK. Um, it will be hybrid, though we'd really like you to come, you know, you can do, come, and, come and join online, but we'd also love to see you if you could travel. So we're trying to make it open. I've put a link in the chat to the call for papers, and I've also put the Twitter um, handle as well. For as long as we stay on Twitter, we'll see. We might move like lots of people. Um, but the topics, we're calling it Fair Trade Connections. And one of the things, recognising there's probably a need to debate and think about fair trade in different ways and linking it to various movements, including understandings of consumption in different parts of the world, uh, as well as the, the connection with production, localising the economy, um, education for sustainable development and linking that campaigning message and decolonization is another theme that we're, we're, we're looking to have, have connect, um, papers on. So we're trying to think about how the fair trade movement can learn from these newer or revived movements. And again, linking, thinking it back, back to alliances and mutual learning and support. Um, so that's my uh, quick plug. Um, and I put a link in, in the chat to both the um, call for papers, which was a few, few minutes ago, um, that's the events cloud, and we need a better um, URL, um, events cloud one 